next speaker, Nick, who volunteered to tell us about Stieplatz. I, he he uh, introduced the topic to me as something like, uh, you know, I'm a Python hacker and I keep going back to R for ggplots and I completely agree. It's like, this is why I tell people I'm still using R after 10 years of frustration. <laughs> it's like, we don't have ggplots in any other language, so please tell us about that. Thank you. Um, so, like Toby said, my name is, uh, is Nicholas Kushten. Um, just the agenda for this, I hope you guys can all read this. Um, I'll, I'll do my best with the screen here, it's a little small. But basically I'm going to tell, myself, tell you guys a little bit about me. I'm going to ask a couple questions just to get a sense of like who's in the audience. And then I have kind of two, two disconnected things to tell you about. One is ggplot, which is uh, what I consider to be one of the best visualization libraries in the world, and I'll tell you why I think that. And then the second thing is uh, rpivottable. So rpivottable is an R package for generating uh, drag and drop pivot tables. And the reason I will tell you about that is because it's based on, on top of uh, a JavaScript library which I wrote. So, uh, I will, Can you slow I will. down a little bit? Sure. This is talking very fast. I know. Sorry, it's my default. <laughs> um, okay, so about me. Um, I work at uh, Datacratic. Datacratic is a machine learning company based here in Montreal. We're a startup. We've been around for five years. And we build uh, the machine learning database. So it's essentially a, a tool for doing machine learning. I encourage everyone to check it out at uh, mldb.ai. It's very cool. But I'm not really here to talk that today. Um, I also created a JavaScript library called pivottable.js, which is a sort of drag and drop pivot table implementation uh, in JavaScript, and I'll show you guys that uh, in a minute. So that's a little bit about me. Um, so about you guys. Uh, so who here uses R like on a weekly basis? Okay, it's the R group, right? Yeah. Um, so do you guys, who here uses like the command line interface only, not R, R Studio? Who here uses R Studio or like a graphical? Okay, so we still know our studio. Emacs. Sorry. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I did not realize that was a thing. Okay. Come on. How did you do that? So he, who here, uh, who here has ever used ggplot before? Ever used? Ever used ggplot? Yeah. Ever. Okay. So who here um, like kept using it after starting it? And who here like never used it again because they don't like it? I'm talking about this. I'm sorry. I don't use this. Okay. And who uses it sometimes? <laughs> Who uses it sometimes? Okay. Cool. And then who here has used like, the pivot table feature in Excel? Okay. Awesome. Okay, this gives me a sense of, of who's who. Okay, so um, a little bit about sort of ggplot from my perspective and why I'm here telling you about it. So I'm a huge data visualization nerd. I kind of try most of the tools that are out there to, to kind of get a sense of what you can do with it, how it works. Um, I do most of my data analysis work in Python. Uh, the Python community has a, an, a copy of the R data frame uh, called Pandas, um, and I mostly use that for, for data analysis. But anytime I need to do uh, data visualization uh, more seriously than what I can do with Pandas, I always kind of come back to R. Um, and the reason is because of this library called ggplot2. Um, and from my perspective, it's sort of the Goldilocks of, of uh, data visualization tools. It's higher level than a kind of a drawing library. So if you've ever used um, a piece of software for doing drawing, where you like draw a line from this pixel to this pixel, or draw a circle where the center is of this pixel and it's got this radius, that's like a really low level uh, drawing kind of API. So I've used some of those to do visualization, and like, well, you end up doing a lot of trigonometry, you end up doing a lot of like calculating of scales and stuff. So ggplot is higher level than that. Um, but there are a lot of visualization libraries out there in the world which are sort of charting tools. They're sort of the programming equivalent of Microsoft Excel, where you can like, you have a function for doing a line chart, and that's all it does, it does a line chart. You have a function for doing a scatter chart, and that's all it does, it does a scatter chart, um, or a pie chart, or something like that. And it's kind of difficult to use the same data and sort of make a pie chart, and then turn it into a line chart, or see what it would look like, kind of experiment. So, um, from, from, from my perspective, ggplot is kind of in between the two. And the reason, or in the way in which it's able to do that is because it's based uh, on, a, on a sort of formalization of uh, visualization called the grammar of graphics. So that's why it's called ggplot. It's the grammar of graphics plotting system. And the grammar of graphics, first of all, is a fairly large textbook, which I haven't read all of, but uh, enough to kind of familiarize myself with it. Um, it's basically um, a, a language for describing a data graphic. So, uh, instead of saying it's a scatter plot, it's basically saying, well, you have some data, you have these two columns, and this column will be mapped to the, mapped to the x-axis, and this column will be mapped to the y-axis, and we're going to make dots. And so instead of kind of assuming that all of the visualizations that you might want to make fall into like a little taxonomy, like, you know, the little Excel uh, point and click 
menu of graphics. Um, it, the, the grammar of graphics gives you kind of a language for describing uh, what a data graphic would look like. And ggplot is an R implementation of uh, an approximation of the grammar of graphics. And so that's all the like abstract talking I'll do. I'll kind of show you, and I'll uh, I'll loop back around, and hopefully I will convince you that that ggplot is really cool. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry. I thought... Okay, I do that too. Um, so let me just kind of. Uh, hopefully this is, I'm going to kind of switch back and forth, hopefully this is big enough. So, so yeah, I have a question. So QuantMod then would be called a charting tool, then, right? Um, from my perspective, QuantMod probably is bigger than just a charting tool, but the charting pieces are just a charting tool from my perspective. They don't really allow you to manipulate the graphical primitives all that much from, from the limited perspective that I got, yeah. Um, so to load up uh, ggplot, you kind of do the thing. So. Um, the first kind of call you might try to do with ggplot is just, I'm going to use the empty cars data set. Does everyone know it? No. Yeah. Okay, so the empty cars data set is basically uh, one row per kind of car. There's just a few, I think there's like 30 or 40. Um, and there's a, it's the motor trends uh, data set. So basically for each car you have a little bit of information about the car, so it's mileage, uh, the number of cylinders that it has, does it have an automatic transmission or not. Um, and, uh, displacement, which I think is sort of, sort of measure of the internal dimensions of the engine. Um, so I'm going to use this. It's built into to R, and it's very simple to reason about. Um, but you can use, obviously, ggplot with anything you want. So if you just call ggplot uh, on empty cars, you can at the bottom it says, uh, error, no layers in plot. So I think this turns off a lot of people because it's like, well, come on, do something. Um, so the way, that, the way that ggplot works, and this is the first kind of thing that people are like, ooh, what is this? I'm not used to this kind of graphing library. Um, is you basically create a ggplot object, and then you have to add things to it to make it work. So you have to add layers. So um, I'm going to show you basically a really simple plot here. Uh, this is essentially your your sort of box standard bar chart, right? So what did we do? We did ggplot with empty cars, and then we added, um, and then the, the output of this function called geom bar. Okay, so you know. It's a bar, we added bars to it. Uh, and then to geom bar, the arguments were this uh, AES, x equals factor CYL. So AES is the way that ggplot handles mapping between, what, uh, between the sort of aesthetic variables, the visual variables, and the data. So in this particular case, um, I'm mapping the factor uh, CYL, which is the number of cylinders in the car, I'm mapping that to the x variable. And I'm passing that mapping into the geom bar function. And so what that does is it basically gave me this bar chart where at the bottom here I have the number of cylinders uh, in the cars. And Geom bar kind of did the thing that it could do, which is it said, well, you didn't tell me what you wanted the height of the bar to be. So by default, I'm just going to make it the number, of, the number of vehicles that match each, each number of cylinders. And so this is how you make a really simple bar chart uh, in ggplot. So you know, there was no function called bar chart. There's no function called line chart. You just kind of add layers onto the to the basic plot. So I'm going to kind of walk through a bunch of different variations of this plot to give you guys a kind of feel for how this how this thing works. So um, I'm going to run the same command here, except I'm going to add um, an aesthetic mapping, which is I'm going to map the, uh, the the gear to the fill. So the fill is going to be the color of the bar. So if I execute that, um, it got a little narrower, but Essentially here, you have the same bar chart as you had before, except each little segment has been divided into three, uh, or has been divided, and each little subsegment has been colored by the number of gears. So you can see how essentially these two charts are the same, right? It's just that here, they've been sort of subdivided. And so you can kind of start to detect that in fact, uh, each one of these vertical bars is like a little stack where each little piece represents one car, and so here, all of the cars that have three gears have been colored in red, and all the cars that have four gears have been colored in uh, in green, and uh, and red has been sorry, uh, five gears have been colored in blue. So um, you know you can start to kind of mix in different uh, el data elements and map them to different visual variables. So there's a bunch of different visual variables that are sort of system can process right, you can process position, length, <laughs> color, orientation, shape, texture, and most of these things you can kind of map uh, data variables to. I'll show a couple of examples of that. So far, so good? Yep. Speed okay? Still yeah, fast? Still yeah. Okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm excited. So, yeah. <laughs> um, off the 
top of my head, I don't remember, but I think you would say stat equals count or stat equals bin or something like that. Um, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll kind of look back around, but um, I'll find that for you. Um, okay, so here I basically made a, in general. Actually, you can just type Yankar. Yeah, but I don't want to get into reading the doc. Um, so, uh, so so far I showed you a bar chart, and this is essentially in sort of the taxonomy of some other uh, ch charting packages. This would be called a stack bar chart, right? Um, I can also make uh, a, a grouped bar chart by adding one more parameter, which is here I say position equals dodge. So dot, position equals dodge means essentially sort of break apart the little stacked bars and put them next to each other. The default value of position I think is stacked. So the bar, the things end up stacked on top of each other. But here, this is essentially the same plot, right? It's just like the bars are next to each other versus on top of each other. And so this is how ggplot handles this visual mapping, um, this, sorry, this mapping of the, the variables onto this, uh, this visual variables. So I've shown you how to make uh, bar charts, stack bar charts, group bar charts, just by kind of adding a couple, a couple of parameters to the geom bar function. Um, you can also do, I think this is basically the same. Okay. Um, I can also uh, make one big stacked bar. I'm oh, sorry, this is what I want to do. Um, okay. So if I say that I want um, the, x, uh, the x visual variable to just be mapped to a single value, one, then you would get essentially all of the cars stacked together with one big bar, right? And if I say that the width of this um, of this bar is one, which is basically 100%, it's the full width of the of the chart, then you get this sort of weird sort of vertical stripe. It's like the, everything sort of stacked together. And it turns out that actually a bar chart and a, and a pie chart are pretty similar to each other. If I just take this little vertical stripe here and map it into polar coordinates instead of vertical coordinates, so instead of going up, I basically say, well, the, I map the y dimension to the angle of a circle, and I can turn this into a bar chart. Uh, sorry, a pie chart. So you see that ggplot doesn't have a special function for bar chart and a special function for pie chart. It has a function for mapping data variables to visual variables, and then a separate function, chord polar in this context, uh, for mapping the coordinates to the actual like positions of the pixels. So this is kind of a different way of thinking about data visualization. Uh, from the sort of typical, you know, I want a pie chart, therefore I'm going to look for a function called pie charts. Like, I want a pie chart. What is a pie chart? Right? Uh, a pie chart is essentially, uh, you, you basically declare that you have all of the angles possible and you want to divide the, the, the pie into percentages based on uh, a particular data variable. And so in this particular case, um, this, is a, this is a pie chart of the distribution of the number of cylinders uh, that the cars in the data set have. So far so good? Okay. Um, so from my perspective, this is like a really powerful way of thinking about visualization because you're not kind of stuck in these little templates, right? You can really kind of start to think about things. So you can actually, by playing with some of these parameters, you can get some kind of weird stuff. So if you forget the fact that you wanted all of the uh, variables mapped to the same x, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, you can make some kind of funky some funky graphs that like don't really have names where you have kind of circles and disks and wedges and stuff. So when you when you kind of break out of the sort of mold of having pie, chart, pie charts, you can map the variables onto, onto whatever you like. So the other really neat thing, um, sorry, so here I've just shown you essentially bars and how to map bars onto bars and bars onto, onto pie wedges. Uh, obviously, uh, ggplot allows you to do what is typically called a scatter plot. So here I'm gonna do the same basic kind of thing, except instead of the uh, bar geom, I'm going to use the point geom. And so geom here is essentially, uh, stands for geometry, so it's sort of a geometrical object that's being rendered on the screen. Um, so here I've used the point geom, and I've mapped mpg, the miles per gallon, to the, uh, to the x aesthetic, and disp, which is the displacement of the engine, to the y aesthetic. And so here I've basically got a scatter plot of displacement uh, versus miles per gallon. And you see that essentially the API, all I've done here is I, I have to change geom bar for geom point and map like a different variable, right? And if I want to make a scatter plot the other way, I can just kind of interchange y and x, and obviously I'm going to get the transpose, right? Just kind of 
mapping, uh, mapping different things here. Um, so I can also add multiple geoms to the same plot. So here I'm going to add the smoothing geom, which with the same variables, same mapping. And what you'll see is that I've now done a low S smoothing on top of the, uh, the chart. So you can kind of keep adding layers. And I won't go through like every kind of layer that you can add, but you can add text annotation layers, you can add uh, other lines, you can add vertical lines, you can add you know, diagonal lines, all of these kind of things that you want to add. You're just using the plus operator to do it. So uh, in answer to the sort of same question to, uh, that you asked uh, the guy about quant, quant mod, sorry, Peter, <laughs> um, you can just keep layering whatever you want on top of a, of a GT plot, uh, plot. And so here you might notice that you've got a little bit of repetition in the code, right? You've got uh, geom point and you're mapping x. You're mapping, mapping essentially the same values to x and the same values to y both times. So uh, it turns out that, that the ggplot object itself, you can map things, uh, you can map data to visual variables at the top level of the plot and it kind of inherits throughout the other layers. So here I'm going to execute essentially the same thing except I didn't have to repeat the fact that, I, um, that I'm mapping miles per gallon to x and it just got inherited for both the point and the smooth. So uh, it's, you know, it can be a verbose uh, library to use uh, if you're kind of just doing it automatically, but then you, you can refactor your code a little bit to make it a little more, uh, a little more elegant. The scale? Yeah, so those are, uh, those are uh, options to the geom smooth. Yeah. Um, so uh, obviously like in any other scatterplot type tool, you can play with the color. So if I add, um, not only am I going to map to the x and y uh, visual variables, but I'm also going to map the number of cylinders now to the color. Um, you get this kind of funny plot where you've got essentially um, uh, the miles per gallon and the displacement, same as before, except uh, based on the number of cylinders, things are in different colors, and you've got a different smooth for each color, right? The reason you have a different sort of um, smooth, smooth line for each color is because I map that at the top level. Uh, of the of the ggplot, and so all of the all of the geoms inherited that mapping, and it turns out that if I just take the the color mapping and I pass it just to the points, then I'm going to get what maybe you were expecting to see, which is um, the plot with the original overall smooth line, and then just the points are colored by the number of cylinders. Yeah. Yeah. So factor basically, uh, if you don't put factor, um, ggplot will interpolate. Will oh, I'll show you. Uh, ggplot will basically uh, put, assume that it's a continuous color scale that you want as opposed to a discrete color scale. So here you see that now it's, a, it's inferred a, a continuous color scale because it saw that the, the, the data contained within the variable were numbers. And I was like, oh, well, I guess they're numbers along the same scale, so we must want shading. In this particular case, I knew that I know that there's only three numbers, and so I wanted to, to display them as discrete, discrete variables. So that's playing with what ggplot is assuming about the data. You can also force it to use uh, a continuous scale or a discrete scale if you want. I'll show something similar to that in a second. Does that explain your answer your question? Okay. So then um, this is uh, the thing that, uh, sorry, and here the points are a little bit small, so I just show that you can kind of force things, like I'm gonna force the size to be 10, uh, which looked good on my monitor, but uh, this is a slightly smaller screen, so let's go four. Anyway, you guys can see the colors a little bit better. So here, um, it's a little hard to see because of the bracket here, but uh, here I put size equals four outside of the aesthetic mapping because this is not, the four is not like a property of the row. It's just I want all of the points to be four. If I actually take the size equal four here and put it inside the aesthetic mapping, it'll give you the same chart, except you'll see that in the legend, now it's telling you that, oh, by the way, I've sized everything according to a variable called four, whose value is four for all the points. It's kind of a little bit ugly, so I, I, I left it outside the aesthetic mapping. Um, and then now, this is kind of the, the, so far, you know, I've shown you that, you know, good job, you can make scatter plots with a, with, a, with a charting tool, this is not that exciting. This is kind of the part of the, um, of the demo that I usually give about ggplot that blows people away if they've only ever used, like, the Python matplotlib system, is all I need to do to make a, a, a lattice chart is I add, this, uh, this function facet grid, and I can make, uh, I'm gonna go back to having a four, size four here. Um, I've now kind of broken up my chart into six different subcharts that are all axis aligned. So here what I said was I added the, the facet grid option 
uh, with uh, gears versus AM. AM is uh, whether it's an automatic transmission or not. And so what I've done here is I've created a grid of scatter plots, right? Where uh, the, all the ones on the left here uh, do not have an automatic transmission, all the ones on the right do have an automatic transmission. And then you know, the first row is the sort of three cylinders, four cylinders, and then five cylinders, right? And each of these, you'll see that this, they, they essentially scare, share an X scale and they share a Y scale. And so instead of kind of breaking them up by color or by shape or something like that, here I've got color maps to the number of cylinders. Um, I, I could have maybe mapped uh, shape to the number of gears, but it kind of gets a little bit difficult to start to see patterns when you have like shapes and colors. So I've decided to sort of break them out across different facets. Um, so this is a very powerful, uh, powerful feature that doesn't exist in a lot of other uh, charting tools, although, although some of them do have it. Uh, and so you can see here that um, it's actually just really easy to do, right? You just kind of add this facet grid and put, you know, facets. So this is kind of neat. Um, and the other thing, so the next kind of thing that I want to show you guys is here. You know, you may have noticed that, well, I'm starting to kind of add a lot of things. This is starting to feel a little verbose. Is this really the, the charting library that I want to use or the, the plotting library that I want to use? Um, in response to this, the sort of the guy who, uh, who makes ggplot, whose name is Hadley Wickham, uh, put together a special function called qplot, which is sort of a one-liner way of making this exact same chart. Um, and so qplot, if I execute this, you'll see that you get essentially the same, uh, go back to four here, the same, uh, the same chart. And so here, qplot essentially uh, gives you a shortcut to having to create a ggplot and then add a whole bunch of layers. So here I've just said data equals empty cars, and I've got all the mappings in one line here. So x equals my miles per gallon, y equals displacement, color equals the number of cylinders, size. Here I had to do a little special thing. I put it, I, I essentially called the identity function on four, so that all this all the plots would be the same, uh, the same oh, sorry, the dots would be the same size, and then facets equals. Uh, uh, gears compared to the automatic transmission or not. So this is an extremely compact representation of this data graphic, right? And in fact, instead of me having to say, okay, it's a grid of scatter plots, right? It's a graphic, and then you kind of just read it. You can read all the, the sort of data mapping right off of it, right? What data are you using? It's MT cards, okay? Uh, okay, I guess you, I didn't, you know, mention, I didn't, doesn't say automatically which geom it is, the default is point, but you can sort of say geom equals point, so. Each, uh, each row in the data is, uh, is represented by a point whose x position is miles per gallon, and whose y position is the displacement, and whose color is the number of cylinders, whose size is four, and oh, by the way, I have this broken up across a grid of, uh, of plots uh, where across the top I've got the, whether it's an automatic transmission or not, and up and down it's the number of gears. So you can kind of, I hope, uh, by my little explanation here, see why this is called the sort of the grammar of graphics plotting language because it's essentially trying to create um, a grammar to describe the data graphics and allow you to code by describing the graphic that you want rather than trying to match to a particular template, like a very high level charting library, or actually forcing you to issue sort of drawing primitives, like move the cursor to this pixel and draw a circle of this size. Am I starting to convince you guys? Um, so, uh, a few other things, so the, the output of qplot here actually is just a valid ggplot object, just like the output of all of, these, uh, all of these functions. So you can actually continue adding stuff to it, right? You can build your initial, your initial, initial graphic with qplot and then add extra options. So here, I'm gonna show you a couple things about how to control, um, uh, control a few other things about the, the, the plot. So here, this is the exact same uh, line as above here. I'm gonna add scale color manual. Uh, and the values, instead of the sort of default values, I'm going to use a, a more saturated red, blue, and green. So this is how you can, you can control the scale. Um, you can actually control the color scale. This, this is a, a manual discrete scale, but if I wanted to, I could provide a manual continuous scale and tell it what the endpoints are, and it would interpolate between the two. Um, I'm also adding the, this, uh, the output of this labs object, which allows me to set the title. And then I'm going to add a theme object which is going to put the legend at the bottom. And so if I execute this, you kind of get uh, what it says in the box. And this is still too big. Right, so the legend ended up at the bottom, the colors are a little bit different, and you got a title. So you can see how it kind of, you just, anything you want to change, you kind of add the output of another function to it. Um, summation of all of these layers is this is this plot. Um, it's a little eccentric. Uh, so that was kind of the um, the the endpoint of the beginning part of the demo. 
Um, I'm going to just give you a brief look at the documentation for ggplot because it uh, basically contains the answer to pretty much any question you might have. Um, so the documentation for ggplot <coughs> is just at uh, docs.ggplot2.org. And it's actually really neat. The way it's organized, it's, uh, it's organized by sort of type of function. So help topics, geoms. And you'll see that essentially it just lists all of the available geoms. So the only ones I showed you in my demo were bar and points, just because those are the kind of the obvious ones. But you've got a beeline, and then you've got a helpful little kind of graphic in the side here. So if you kind of know what kind of graphic you want to make, if you have like a picture in your head, you kind of just like look down the side here and you're like, oh yeah, that's kind of what I want. Area, okay, geom area. I'm looking for kind of an area type plot. And so you've got, you know, your bars, your bins, uh, box plot, contour, crossbar. So any kind of sort of specific kind of drawing type that you want, uh, a lot of them have already been uh, implemented for you as geoms. Um, that's essentially the different marks on the plot that would, rec that would represent your data. The next section, uh, there's a whole bunch of them. The next section, uh, one of my favorite ones here is the violin plot for uh, representing distributions, very pretty. Um, the next section is statistics, which kind of answers one of the questions that was asked. Um, so stat bin is how you uh, actually map sort of statistics about the data to various uh, various variables. So when I did a bar chart, stat bin was the, the default and it made the height of the bars uh, the count per bin, essentially. Um, <laughs> And there's all sorts of other functions that you can use. So there's bin 2D, if you want to do sort of a, if you have over plotting in the scatter plot. There's a bin dot, which I'll show you an example of in a second. Bin hex, so when you want to uh, show essentially a hexagonal heat map. Uh, box plots, a whole bunch of stuff to deal with distributions and densities. Obviously, this is R. So uh, a whole bunch of statistical functions. And then you get down to scales. So I showed you one example of scale. I showed you scale color manual, where I'm overriding the color mapping. Uh, but you've got a whole bunch of different ones. You've got sort of a divergent color scale, gradient color scales, a couple versions of each of those, gray. Um, and then you have scales for shapes, so you can map shapes onto different uh, variables. You've got a scale for size, uh, X and Y. And then you've got special scales for dealing with dates, um, if you have like time series data, uh, and uh, functions for dealing with sort of labels and, and that sort of thing. And then coordinate systems, I showed you Coordinate uh, Cartesian is the default, but I also showed you coordinate polar, my, uh, my sort of fake pie chart. Um, you've got a map coordinate system if you want to plot um, essentially geometric, uh, geographical data. Um, faceting, so there's a few different options for faceting. You can make a grid like I showed you, but you can also just kind of make a wrap of a grid on, the, on only one variable. Um, the position adjustments, so I showed you position dodge versus position stacked. Um, and there's a bunch of data that comes with it. And the final one I wanted to show you was themes. Um, so you, uh, I showed you essentially one way to change part of the theme, which is to show where the legend goes. Um, you can also uh, edit pretty much anything about the theme. You can get rid of the background. You can get rid of the, you know, change the color of anything you want. Um, and then, I don't know where guides went, but um, you can also control the legend fairly, uh, fairly effectively. So pretty much anything you might want to do with ggplot, you kind of just at least the way I approach this is I kind of get to the documentation page, scroll around, look for a little thing down the side that looks kind of like what I think I might be wanting, uh, and then sort of read the options. And the, the API is sort of generally fairly uniform. Like the way you call one geom is the way you call all the geoms. The way you call one um, uh, facet function is the way you call all the facet functions. How would coordinate that, for example? Um, it's basically a map projection, so it, it handles stuff like uh, the fact that you know, sort of, you, you don't want necessarily to always map uh, x, y, x and y to latitude and longitude in a sort of linear way. You may handle the curvature of the Earth, so it lets you uh, map onto that. So then you could take like New Zealand, and you could have one column to represent perhaps. Uh, uh, this is more for the for the for the mapping of the like. You can essentially show the actual curvature of the Earth okay. as opposed to like always using a Mercator projection or something like that. So that's what the core map specifically does. Can you use ggplot, for example? Like, say you want to map GDP and have the uh, country's size that represent the country's GDP? Uh, that would be called a, a cartogram, and I don't believe that there's a geom for that. But you could potentially build such a thing. That might be kind of difficult. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there's a built-in one for that. Um, so I've shown you, I've told you a lot of the thing, different things about why ggplot is really neat. Um, and, I, and I still do, do use it for a lot of things. But uh, there are some limitations uh, to ggplot. So it's my favorite uh, plotting language. But, uh, you know. Doesn't, doesn't do everything. So uh, two specific limitations that I just want to highlight. 
One is it doesn't really do interactive graphics, right? Um, you can't now mouse over the geoms here and have it sort of pop up a little thing and tell you like the actual value of something. So it doesn't really do interactive graphics uh, at all. Um, and you can't sort of you know drag and pan and zoom and do some of the more fancy stuff that you might uh, expect that you can do in JavaScript. So actually, there's a solution to that, and that's called my animate R package. It's called animate. So okay. This is a, a basically adds a couple of keywords like uh, tooltip. Cool. Yeah, but then you're not using ggplot. You're using Plotly's sort of ggplot work. Yeah, no, no, I'm just saying the specific limitations of ggplot itself here, the, the rendering sort of substrate that it has, as far as I know, doesn't permit for, for mouse overs and stuff, but animate, I guess. So yeah, actually, what we, do is we use ggplot, but we provide it an alternate renderer. Yeah. So, like you mentioned, ggplot is an object. So we just take that object and we output a web page. Yeah, that's really cool. I'll take it as an animate. Okay, awesome. So out of the box, ggplot doesn't have uh, doesn't have interaction, but obviously uh, people are, are building add-ons. And then the second thing is that ggplot uh, kind of is unable to do certain types of sort of composed graphics. So if you wanted each uh, each point here to be a pie chart, for example, I don't believe that there's a way to do that within ggplot. You can't have sort of individual geoms be their own little subcharts. So you can't have a scatter plot of plots or something like that, which can be a bad idea, but there's some kind of advanced uh, visualization types where you would want essentially a bubble chart, so you would want you know, each country to be uh, uh, at a particular point uh, in, in a scatter plot, and then each circle to be a pie chart of sort of the composition of that country's economy or something like that. Like, there's certain kinds of things which don't fit into ggplot's uh, way of describing graphics. So it's, you know, it's a grammar of graphics, but there are limitations to the, the sentences that you can write in this grammar. That was basically it about theory. I wanted to show one uh, neat graphic that I made um, for myself as I was learning ggplot. So uh, it's kind of a real, real world example that I presented uh, actually in this room at uh, the Visualization Montreal meetup. Um, so I have a data set which is, um, it's out of date now because there's been an, an election <laughs> since, but it's basically the 2012 Canadian Parliament. Um, and so what I did was I built, uh, I built a data set uh, which has uh, essentially one row per MP, so here you see all the MPs, you've got their name, their party, the province that they were elected from, and then uh, I went onto the, uh, on the, a mix of Wikipedia and the Parliament website and I scraped their gender and their age uh, as of 2012, uh, and I didn't get it for all of them, so some of them are, are NA. So this is the basic data set and I was kind of wanting to see whether I could make one plot that would able to, was able to show in a sort of comprehensible way uh, all four of the data variables here, so party, province, uh, age, and gender, and I ended up doing that in ggplot. So um, I, uh, first of all, remapped the uh, the party and province names uh, by just kind of messing with the data frame. So here, you now you see that the provinces have been replaced by their uh, province code, uh, and the all of the parties have been shortened to three letters, so BLQ for the bloc, LIV for the liberals, CON for the conservatives, and NDP for the NDP. And then um, I built this little, uh, pro oops, sorry, this little program, uh, which makes this little graphic. And so this is essentially a graphic that I made, uh, which you know, I consider to be sort of finished uh, in ggplot. So it's got a title, it's got a legend, it's kind of reasonably comprehensible. And obviously, it's leveraging the faceting uh, aspects of ggplot. So what you've got is across. Uh, across the page, you've got all the different provinces in Canada, and I, I grouped the territories together sort of in the middle. And then uh, down, uh, up and down, you've got all the different provinces. And within each little subplot, you have a dot plot. So each dot here is one MP. You have a dot plot, and with the position of each dot uh, within the plot on the horizontal axis is how old that MP is, um, and the color is, the, is their gender. So you can kind of get a sense. Uh, briefly, you know, Ontario clearly has the most MPs, it's got the most dots in it, um, and it was very strong for the Conservatives. Uh, the NDP were very strong in Quebec. The NDP have a bit of a different age distribution specifically in Quebec. There's a lot more women in the NDP. The Liberals were fairly decimated across the country in the previous election, uh, and the Greens only got one person elected, uh, just like this time around. So, um, this is basically a data graphic, and you know, the way I would describe this is sort of a faceting uh, across provinces and parties of dot histograms where the color of each dot is the gender and uh, the horizontal position is the age. And 
if you look at the actual code here, you know, in a slightly sort of stilted ggplot, that is basically what you get, right? You've got ggplot, and I'm mapping the subset of the MPs for which the age is known, okay? And then the aesthetic mapping here is that the x variable is the age, the fill color is the gender, uh, and the color is the gender. So uh, if I didn't do that, you got a kind of a, a circular outline around the dots that I didn't want. Um, the geom I used was dot plot, which is essentially a geom specifically for making uh, histograms out of dots. Uh, I use a facet grid, party by province, um, scale y continuous, I basically uh, needed to play with the scale a little bit. I put the, the legend at the bottom, the legend <coughs> didn't need a title in this particular case, uh, and I put in some labels. So this is how I made this little graphic. Um, yeah. How would that handle representative through stages? I just skipped them. Yeah, uh, and you can also just put them all at zero if you want. So I mean, it's not confusing because sort of we, we expect no representatives to be zero <laughs> or to be under the age of five. So you could you could just stick them all on the end. But I made an editorial decision not to plot them. But uh, true to uh, to sort of uh, standards of honesty, I think I actually called that out in the title. <laughs> uh, still rendering. Here we go. I actually said you know. Each dot represents that one MP, three are missing due to unknown things. So that's, that's how I represented them. Um, so, thank you. So I have a few other examples, but I've, I've kind of spent my 35 minutes on ggplot, so I figured I'd move on to the pivot table part of the. So that's a question. Yes. Uh, is uh, ggplot built on top of like, uh, the opulent sort of like uh, graphics? So that if I want to do something on top of it, that's not ggplot, like, um, I don't know the non ggplot primitives enough, but it's built on top of a package called grid, which I believe yeah, is super primitive. Yeah, so it's built on top of grid. But if you wanted to make a line, there's a geom line. If you wanted to put a, some text, there's geom text. So there's there's geoms that are built to do most of the things that you want. I don't know how recommended it would be to go out and actually draw lines on there. The nice thing about using the geoms is that you can map the variable straight in, so if you change the scale, your line gets drawn in the right place. So you can make a line and then say, you know, log transform, and your line gets log transformed, as opposed to sort of putting the line in the physical pixel values and sort of hoping for the best. No problem. Um, I did not build the data set for 2015 yet. No, I, uh, I may someday. Um, yeah, that was my question actually. Did it take more time to get the data from the web or to make the plot? I didn't take that long to get the data from the web. Actually, I didn't take that long to make the plot either. They were both fairly, fairly quick, like an hour each or something. Yeah, 50-50. Um, and what other iterations did you go through before you were writing? It was in 2012, so I don't really remember. Yeah. I think I played with, um, I played with just normal histograms, lines. Um, different facetings, like basically I think I, uh, actually, I'll show you a couple different things uh, and I can come back to that. Um, so the reason I actually built this data set was partly to play with ggplot but partly uh, as a demonstration data set for uh, my sort of personal side project which is uh, pivottable.js. So um, I've already loaded the, um, the MP's data set here so I will just kind of show you what that looks like uh, and then I'll, I'll walk you through sort of why it's neat. So this is the uh, pivot table uh, UI. And so just from R, I was able to kind of generate this drag and drop interface. You know, I can take party and put it here, and now I've got a little table of parties. I can put province here, and I've got the count uh, of the MPs here, but I, I can also do their average, let's say, age. And I can build a table of the average age of each MP by party, by province, just by sort of dragging and dropping. So I was able to get get, get to this from one line of R code. So that's, I'm sorry? Yeah, let me, let me finish. <laughs> so um, so this, is, this is kind of where I'm getting to. And so all I did to get this was I loaded the R pivot table uh, R package, and then I called R pivot table on the, on the data frame. And what it does is it renders in here, in the plotting area, some actual HTML. And so it's a little truncated here because it's a small screen, but it, 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 it totally works. And so what this is doing under the hood is it's using the uh, HTML widgets uh, R package, which I believe was written here in Montreal, to uh, essentially render HTML and JavaScript into the plotting area, 
Uh, this is kind of a neat feature of RStudio is that it's got a browser essentially in here, and that's why when you go look at the help, you know, it's a browser and you can click. So it's kind of hijacking that capability um, to render a pivot table uh, into here. And all of the titles here are lifted from the data frame uh, title. And so you know you just do our pivot table here with empty cars, and you've got here um, a, a pivot table with all of the, uh, you know, I can do like a table of cylinders versus uh, whatever, miles per gallon versus cylinders. Here and I can look at a little table here. Uh, I can also make a chart. So here I'm looking at a table, but I can also make a line chart. Uh, line chart is not a good idea. Bar chart. <laughs> um, a bar chart by, of cylinders. Uh, sorry, the screen is very small. Okay, here we go. Cylinders, table, bar chart. And kind of, so this is a bar chart. It's kind of a grouped bar chart with one group. You can also kind of make a bar chart with multiple groups. Um, and then um, you can make a scatter plot of miles per gallon versus displacement all interactively. And because this is actually using HTML uh, and SVG under the hood, you actually do get uh, the mouse over here. So you can actually kind of take a look at what's, what's going on. Um, and you can make you can color these by the number of cylinders. So here they're all essentially the same. Um, so this is essentially uh, our pivot table. And it's just kind of a way of doing data exploration. So it can handle approximately 100,000 line long data frame before it starts to really slow down because it's using HTML and JavaScript as sort of the back end. Um, but you know, you can get fairly far with that. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to show you guys this. So the, the, what I find really neat is that I built a JavaScript library and sort of open sourced it and people use it and embed it into their web applications. So we, we use it at work for our web applications. And then someone came along and used HTML widget to release an R package for it. So I didn't write the R integration for it. I just wrote the underlying JavaScript implementation. But you know, three, three or four different pieces of open source kind of collaborated to make this possible, right? So someone wrote D3, which is the, the sort of graphic primitive language underneath here. Someone else wrote C3, which is a charting library on top of D3. I wrote a pivot table component, which wraps C3 to make these charts. Someone wrote R, obviously, in RStudio. <laughs> um, and then uh, someone wrote HTML widget, which allows R to be bridged with JavaScript uh, code. And then someone kind of came along and hooked up the wires and put it all together, and now we can all use um, pivot tables with an R, which I think is just awesome. So, um, so you know, yay, everyone who contributed. Um, <laughs> so this is essentially uh, what I wanted to show you. And uh, so the two websites are here, and I'll, I'll make them available uh, as a comment in the meetup. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you, though, is uh, if you go to the examples page for just the JavaScript um, version of the library, you've got um, here the first example. It's uh, I've loaded all 700 of the default demo data sets that are available in R. You can just grab one and visualize it in a pivot table right away. So if you want empty cars, just type empty cars, and it's available here. So if you want to kind of try before you buy, you don't really want to install the module yet, you just kind of want to see what it looks like on a data set which is familiar to you, even though it's free, you can do that. And so this is empty cars. Uh, and just to show that it'll run on a few thousand data points, um, this is 50, 000, a 50,000 line CSV file. It's probably mostly downloading now. Um, and I'm going to make a scatter plot. And it will not be very fast, but it will work. So I want to make a scatter chart of, say, x versus y. Uh, and so here we go. We've got a sort of you know, multi thousand uh, line scatter chart. And I'm going to make it color by color. Uh, and it will do that. So there you go. We've got all the different colors. It's not the most readable scatter chart in the world, but it, you know, uh, it does work and it's rendering you know, tens of thousands of dots here. Uh, on the screen in your browser. So that's basically the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Nick. No problem. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to. Yep. I really like curious how long it would take for you, I don't know if you need to submit the art table to the friend. Uh, so I didn't build our pivot table, so I don't know. Uh, I built the underlying JavaScript engine, but uh, somebody else built the R pivot table system. And it's actually not in CRAM. It's, uh, it's installed by a dev tool, so it's installed directly off of GitHub. Yeah, so they bypassed uh, the CRAM system.
Quick question. What is the website? Uh, ggplot2.org? Yep, that's the website for ggplot. Um, and then the docs are just at docs.ggplot2. But there's only one ggplot. You just Google it. And, yeah. Well, thank you for such a good presentation. You're welcome. Uh, you say that uh, you keep going back to R. Yep, there is a there is a company called YHAT which has made uh, a, a Python module called ggplot, which is API compatible on some level with ggplot. Um, it doesn't support most of the advanced functions, so it supports the sort of core things. Um, it's not it's not complete enough to to be used for for most things. Uh, or sorry, it's, it's complete enough to be used for many things, but then you you reach for a function that you know is in the, the RGG plot and it's sort of not implemented in the Python one. You're like, eh, okay, stop. Um, and then there's also, as uh, as you mentioned, um, Plotly, which is a company based here in Montreal, has a sort of ggplot workalike um, in R, and I think they have a sort of similar API in Python, which does rendering on the web. But it's uh, again, it doesn't necessarily support all of the different functions. Uh, namely, I tried to implement the the geom uh, histodot in Plotly. It doesn't have you know all of the geoms that the, the R version of, of the gplot has. However, from Python, if you use Jupyter, which is the sort of interactive web-based uh, interface to uh, Python, you can execute R code in line and pass uh, data frames back and forth. So essentially, like you don't really have to interrupt your Python workflow to make plots using gplot. You just sort of code in Python and then pass the, pass the data frame over to R, make your plot in R, generate the PNG, display it. Which is generally what I do now. Do you think there is any like, advantage of like, to use Python in R? To use Python in R? Yes. I don't know. You can certainly use R in Python. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can use Python for R. What about the amount of data that you have stored and how much time do you subtract that's that was that's with the pivot table? The pivot table definitely has an upper bound on how much uh, the DOM can handle inside the HTML render. ggplot, you can render as much as you like, it just takes longer. But there's no actual upper bound. I've rendered plots with 500,000 points in them. It just takes a little longer to render. Have you ever experimented with, um, instead of SVG, uh, using Canvas? Um, I've experimented a little bit with Canvas, but I haven't had the time to, to fully swap out the the charting engine of the pivot table with a, a canvas-based one. Uh, if I was going to change anything, I would probably make a WebGL-based one, so it would just be sort of infinitely scalable. Um, yeah. I can show you a quick example of a, a chart with a lot of dots on it. Um, that I made a ggplot. So this is a essentially a dot for every single address on the island of Montreal. So there's a few a few tens of thousands of misrenders in a couple minutes in ggplot. So it just, it just slows down a little bit, but it definitely does. And so this is a ggplot chart. I just turned off all the axes and stuff and made a nice legend for it. What are the colors? This is, the colors are literally by house number. So every, every, sorry? Uh, the higher the number, the more purple it is. Basically, it's on a log scale just because I thought it looked nice, but you can kind of get the overall pattern that like sun along here is in the middle and it kind of just goes more purple out and up. So the east part of the island generally followed the, the, the trend and then for the western communities in the island, in a few different places the numbers sort of reset, like over here in uh, in, uh, in Mohoyal and in San Juan they sort of use their own numbering scheme and then uh, in the west island there's a lot of like low numbers in the tens and twenties. Um, I think that it, that it would really slow down a lot if you tried to put 80,000 points onto Google Maps. It just wouldn't work in the browser. Are there any other questions? I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. Well, actually, yeah, we're not going to stick around. Um, we're going <laughs> to go down the street to Pendix, and we're going to grab a beer, and then we can discuss some more about each browser and some cold one. So let's thank Nicola again.